Have you ever wondered why a company has the name it has? This has been a question uh, throughout my life that just always fascinates me. Why would a company choose a name? And there has been a particular company that always kind of fascinated me, and that was 7-Eleven. Why would they choose to name their company two numbers, one right after the other? And years ago, I finally got the answer to this. See, 7-Eleven wasn't always 7-Eleven. In 1946, uh, up until that point, they were called Totem Grocery. And, and so it wasn't Totem in the sense of the Native American iconography, the statue, the build of beautiful carving. Instead, Totem, T-O-T, apostrophe M. It was to draw forth this image of somebody leaving the store, toting their groceries. Uh, but in 46, uh, following World War II, a foreign company purchased them and renamed it the 7-Eleven. And they chose this name 7-Eleven for a particular reason. They wanted it to communicate something to everyone about the operating hours of the store. So that 7-Eleven was to signify that it was going to open at 7 a.m. and close at 11 p.m., which was a drastic change in what was the kind of the commonly accepted times of, of operating hours for businesses uh, across the country. But it also was to signify something else with the seven. They were telling everyone that they were going to be open seven days a week. Because at that time, uh, pretty much commonplace across all the United States and a lot of the Western world, uh, businesses would be open Monday through Saturday, but would pretty much all close down on Sundays. In fact, across the United States, there was a time, which is, this is the part of this whole story that blew my mind. There was a time when almost everybody together took the same day off. Now, of course, emergency personnel were exempt from this, but businesses, stores, uh, fast food restaurants, everything, almost everything would shut down. And everybody would just have this day off together and they would go to church or maybe just spend time with each other, do projects at home, whatever it may be. But by and large, nobody would work on a Sunday. And when I found out about this, actually, it was my dad who told me uh, this story as we were like driving by a 7-Eleven one day. I, in my teenage years, just being kind of uh, just, just spouting stuff off the top of my head, said to my dad, that seems un-American. How can a business be closed on a Sunday? And, and I'm in my teens. And at that point, every week or not every week, but many weekends, I'd be at my cousin's house and we would be playing video games till like four in the morning in the middle of the night. We would go and purchase uh, the greasiest, cheapest tacos at Jack in the Box that you could, two for 99 cents. Like that was kind of our routine. And I'm thinking, yeah, what did people even do when they were playing video games in the middle of the night? Or <clears throat> what would somebody do on a Sunday if they needed to go pick up a gallon of milk to cook uh, the food for the Sunday dinner? Uh, it just made no sense to me. I couldn't imagine because at the time, it's the end of 1990s, kind of coming into the 2000s, and everywhere I looked, businesses, fast food restaurants, everybody or most stores, chain stores are open 24-7. There's no day off for that. The business has to operate continuously. We need our convenience. In 7-Eleven, they changed, they made this change coming out of World War II because they wanted to increase their market share. They wanted to capture a previously uncaptured one-seventh of the week in which nobody was really spending their money. And it created this just opportunity for economic prosperity. Their company grew and really just spread across the United States. And afterwards, uh, every other chain store ended up having to follow suit to the point where we are today, where almost every business, stores, fast food restaurants to close on a Sunday is unheard of. And to, to not be open late at night is also unheard of. And that what happened is that this country, America, and a lot of the Western countries, they lost this collective day off, which was rooted at the time culturally, but came from a Christian practice. And yes, this, this day where now everything is open again has provided uh, immense wealth and economic prosperity. And really as consumers has provided this opportunity for our convenience uh, has also come at great cost. We have lost amongst many other things an opportunity to worship. And so today we're continuing our series, Treasure. We're looking at uh, worship, what worship is, and how we worship. Last week, Pastor Jason, he looked at a form of worship, musical worship, and the importance of, and how to. And today, we're going to look at another form of worship, 
uh, one that often we don't necessarily even associate uh, fully with worship, and honestly, a practice that uh, the church at large has, has lost, and that is Sabbath. Now, Sabbath, for a lot of people, uh, brings up some, some harsh feelings. Uh, one of the reasons why the practice of Sabbath disappeared in America is because of its connection to legalism. People looked at it, they felt like, I have to do this, and that doesn't really make sense when we live under this covenant of grace. We're saved by Jesus Christ, and we're now doing something that we're trying to earn something, and it's just people would struggle with it. And, and because of that, a lot of people, a lot of churches did away with it. And so what I want to address before we even look at the practice of Sabbath is really look at this idea, is it a requirement? And so the first thing we want to understand is Sabbath originally comes under the Mosaic law. It is a law. It's a requirement for Israel. In fact, it's such a requirement that several times when it's written about, uh, God says that if a person is to break the Sabbath, they will be put to death. They are to be stoned. It is in all aspects a requirement of the Israelites, the Jewish people. But the Sabbath uh, is not just a stopping of physical labor. It was always a stopping of physical labor uh, to be symbolic of their ceasing to strive for acceptance in God's eyes. Really a ceasing of trying to make themselves uh, acceptable or have right relationship with God. That's not the only thing it did, but that was one of the things it was always pointing to. And the idea was, of course, that no amount of upholding the law could ever make somebody right with God. It required the Messiah, it required Jesus Christ. And he was what the Sabbath always pointed to. In fact, in Mark 2, 27 through 28, Jesus, as he's talking with the Pharisees, says, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He's talking about this idea that Sabbath, amongst the, all the other things that it did, was this break, this kind of break for the people of Israel to, to stop trying to make themselves right with God. And it was always, again, pointing to Jesus. And he goes on and says, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And this is a really multi-layered statement. Uh, one of the things it talks about is, is, is just his claim to divinity. He is in fact God and all things fall under his dominion in purview, including how the Sabbath is practiced and, and what that day looks like. But it also is pointing to something else that we see reflected in many of the epistles, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. It was always, always pointing to him that he alone would be the final ceasing of striving to make one acceptable to God because we, the nation of Israel, everyone for all time, we can never achieve that. It could only be found in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. He is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. And with that came the question for the, the church in its infancy and, and really today. So if Jesus is the fulfillment, are we required to keep the Sabbath? And Paul in the, it writes about that. He actually answers this in multiple places in the New Testament. But in Colossians 2, 16 through 17, he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things that come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Again, Jesus was the fulfillment, is the fulfillment of the Sabbath, and it is no longer a requirement for followers of Christ to, to keep. The old law has now been replaced by this new covenant found in Christ. We exist uh, under grace. But just because something isn't a requirement doesn't mean that it isn't beneficial. And so what I want to do is put that, this, uh, this question of requirement, is it a requirement? No, it's not. I want to hold on to all the truth in that, put that to the side and really just look at Sabbath as a practice, a practice that's really beneficial for us and really dive into it, Sabbath as worship. Because I'll be honest, I, I've studied Sabbath pretty in depth for a lot of years. And I would absolutely say worship is part of Sabbath. It's, if, you, if you're Sabbathing, if you're taking that practice, worship should be something that you do. Uh, but it wasn't until recently that I really started to make this connection that worship, or excuse me, Sabbath in and of itself is a form of worship. So the first thing we want to look at is Sabbath is about delighting. And I say is about, it's always been about delighting. In the uh, Exodus 20, this is now where God is giving the Israelites the Ten Commandments. 
Uh, he's giving them this Ten Commandments. He's giving this kind of baseline laws and regulations about how they are going to live, how they are going to be his people. And he gets to the Fourth Commandment. And the Fourth Commandment's interesting because uh, there's this kind of general structure of the Ten Commandments. The first four are about loving God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. And the, the last six are about loving your neighbor as yourself. But the Fourth Commandment's a little bit different because it's actually kind of a bridging commandment. It is about loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, but it's also about community. It's about how we relate to each other. It's a really cool commandment. And he says in it, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, And this word Sabbath right here, this is the same word as we're going through that uh, the, the, the Hebrew word, the root word of it, is actually the same one that is going to be rested. It's this word Shabbat in Hebrew uh, that we say it as Sabbath, and it means literally to cease. It means to cease. And so it's, remember, the cease day in a sense. And the idea is uh, stopping of all work. Now, it says six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You are your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. God is saying no one in Israel is to do any labor. They are to cease their work. And he's really, really uh, kind of drawing all the boundaries around it. He understands that sometimes we're like kids who are presented with a game. The first thing we go to is like trying to figure out how we can weasel our way around the rules. And he's like, you don't get to just put your work onto somebody else. You don't get to transfer it to a donkey and like stand behind them while they do all the work and technically you're not working. Nobody is to work in Israel. And he then gives the reason for this. He points to why are they Sabbathing? He says, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God says to Israel, you're going to cease your work. And in doing so, he's pointing back to the creation story, the narrative, uh, really Genesis 1 and 2, saying this actually starts is, uh, from this creation story. This is where the Sabbath originates from. And so in Genesis 1, up to this point, verse 31, what's happened? God is creating everything. He's speaking everything into existence, uh, the heavens, the earths, uh, earth itself, the plants, the water, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the animals, and on the final day, of course, the sixth day, he makes humans, his favors, creations, the ones that alone will bear his image and the ones that he gives purpose for uh, on his creation. And after, as he's doing all this, God is continually saying at the end of every day, it's good. He's looking at what he has done and he is saying it is good. He's pleased with his creation. But then he finished this day six, he gets to the end of it and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Now he looks out on all of what he has done, everything he has set out to do. And he says, it is very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God in his creation story has this Sabbath, this ceasing uh, on the seventh day. He has a rhythm of which he is creating. Six days he works and on the seventh he stops his work. And actually in this, it says in verse two, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. So God is finished with his work. That is to mean he gets to this point where he has created all that he has desired. It is exactly as he imagined it would end up being when he is done. Like he set out to accomplish something and he accomplished it exactly, exactly the way he wanted. And then it almost repeats itself. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. This word rested here is the same word that we use for Sabbath, Shabbat. It's a different form of the word, but it's still Shabbat. It literally means to cease. So you could read it as this whole statement is God finished what he set out to do and then he ceased doing his work of creation. But there's this interesting, why do we say rested? Why is it rested? Why is it just not ceased? Because um, ceased doesn't capture the fullness of what God is doing on this seventh day. 
If you go ahead and we, found, we actually look at another uh, retelling of this story in Exodus 31, 17, there's something that is added there. It says, It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Again, Shabbat ceased and was refreshed. And both of these words used in relation to God are really interesting because God doesn't need to rest. He doesn't need to be refreshed. God doesn't grow tired. We have scripture that kind of gives us the nature and the characteristics of God. And we, we see in Psalm, and I believe it's Isaiah 40, God doesn't get tired. He doesn't have this like limited store of energy that once he expends it, he needs to go back and just kind of rest himself up. He needs to take a nap or he needs to have a full night of sleep, right? This idea of resting to restore energy is something that humans and animals have. God, he doesn't have that at all. That's not a thing for him. He doesn't need rest. So what does it mean? He's rested and was refreshed. Well, this word refreshed in in the Hebrew word for it, uh, yes, it's refreshed, but it gives this connotation of delighting, delighting and being satisfied. He ceases from his work and then he just delights in it, right? Kind of that continuation of what has happened through the creation narrative. He creates and he says it's good. He creates and he says it's good. And then he gets to the seventh day and he doesn't just say it's good, but he just delights in it. And some scholars have said what this looks like is really what we see immediately following uh, Genesis 1, where now he is, he is walking in the Garden of Eden. He's just enjoying his creation, the trees, uh, the animals, the water, all of it. He's just delighting in it. And he's also just delighting in this, this unmarred relationship he has with Adam and Eve. Everything is perfect as it should be, and he's just enjoying it, enjoying really the fruits of his labor. So what God is telling to Israel and what really we can take forward as we practice Sabbath is it's about delighting in God's creation. It's just looking back to what he has done and delighting in all of it, just saying God is our creator. Look at all that he has given us and blessed us with. It's just this beautiful picture of God's just everything, everything that he has done. But what's interesting is this isn't the only thing God points to as the reason for Sabbath. In Deuteronomy 5.15, he actually gives a different reason. He doesn't point them back to the creation narrative. Instead, he points them to something else. He gives the command of the Sabbath that they shouldn't work. And then he says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So he's not just telling them to delight in the creation that he, has, that he has accomplished, but also to delight in him as their redeemer. That at one point they were slaves to Egypt and he brought them out of that through his mighty hand, through all the miracles, and now has made them a free people, the people of God. For once they belonged to Egypt, they now belong to Yahweh. And for us, right, that's the same idea for us. We get to delight in his creation and his redemption. And of course, his redemption doesn't look the same for us. We weren't brought out of slavery to Egypt, but instead we were brought out of slavery to sin by Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We too can delight in God as creator and redeemer, creator and in, in our salvation. And really what we're doing is really just looking at Jesus as the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He is through his work, this fulfillment, and we're delighting in all of that. We're delighting in what he has accomplished, what he is accomplishing, and what he will accomplish in the future. And so as we practice this Sabbath, how that looks, uh, at least for my family, how does that actually play out? How do we delight in creation? How do we delight in, in Jesus as our Redeemer? And not every Sabbath that we take looks exactly the same, but stuff that we try to do, we try to spend time actually in his creation, delighting in it. Uh, 
During certain seasons of the year, that means going on a hike, spending time in nature, and not just going so that we walk really fast, but just enjoying everything around us, the trees, the water, the plants, the animals, really just stopping and just delighting in the wondrous world that God has created for us. Uh, we enjoy our animals at home. Uh, another part of his creation, of course, is humans. And so we delight together as a family. We just spend time enjoying one another. Uh, I get to delight in the kids that he has placed under my, my, my care, my wife's care. I get to delight in her. We enjoy each other's company, playing and laughing and reading and eating together. And, and sometimes we invite other families in, uh, just delighting in the community that he has given us. But all of it trying to point back to just really truly enjoying what he has given us and being aware, intentional, that it's not just that these things exist, but they are gifts, they are blessings from God. And then we delight, and this is something we're still working on. How does this all look like in our Sabbath that we practice as a family? How do we delight in God is our Savior? Um, part of that's just reading a uh, Bible story, praying together, looking at his redemptive story through all of Scripture, and really just talking to it, having conversations with our kids, uh, age-appropriate conversations they grow up. So ultimately, they know Jesus as their Savior as well. But one of the main things about Sabbath is it is about delighting. It has always been about delighting. That's not the only thing the Sabbath is about. Uh, it's not just about what you are doing on that day that makes it worship. It's also what you are not doing that makes it worship. See, one of the things Sabbath is, is cultural rebellion. Now, I know the world rebellion uh, has has some negative connotations, as it rightfully should, because rebellion against God is sin. It's actually really part of what the, the original sin that we see. Almost, I would say, maybe all sin is a form of rebellion against God. So that's not what I'm saying. This is a rebellion against culture. Kind of that idea that we see in the New Testament, that we live amongst fleshly desires, the ways of the world, amongst Satan. It is a rebellion against all those things in a realignment with our ways, and our hearts towards God. Um, Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 14. This is where, again, it, this is something that's repeated almost every time Sabbath is brought up. What they will not do. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You are your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. God, in giving this Sabbath command to the Israelites, is really reshaping how they will work and kind of who they are. Previously in Egypt, they exist as slaves and their entire purpose is to serve Egypt. They work day after day after day uh, with no end in sight. They exist solely to provide for Egypt. And now he's taking them out and say, yes, work is a part of what you do. There is uh, the very first thing we see Adam placed in the garden. God does it so that he can work. Uh, there is a purpose that we have that involves work. We're not exactly sure what that looked like in the garden, but work in and of itself isn't bad. But what God says is you don't exist solely to work. In fact, there's a rhythm of life that he establishes at creation that he desires us to fall. Work and rest, work and rest, work and delight. And he's trying to change them from a culture that was just literally almost working them to death. And what's interesting about all of this is Sabbath, uh, this, this picture of Sabbath, the idea of Sabbath isn't unique to uh, Israel, right? The word itself, Shabbat, is their word. It's a Hebrew word. And the particular practice of it, of course, is unique to Israel. But what's interesting is this idea of Sabbath rest uh, isn't unique to them culturally or religiously, they came from Egypt, and Egypt had this idea of Sabbath rest as well, this ceasing of work, this rest. And in fact, it too was connected to their origin story, their, their creation narrative. In Egypt, they had the god Ra, 
probably the most famous God, Ra, and I believe it's Ta, who I, I, best I can understand is his father, and Kanum. And I mentioned these three because they're the main players in all this. And in their creation story, they are battling chaos. They're literally bringing order to chaos through war. It involves this fight with dra a dragon or dragons. It's just this epic battle. And in it, they're bringing forth the world and the stars and everything else uh, until they finally defeat the chaos <clears throat> and they decide that they need now to create mankind. But they create mankind for a very specific reason. See, all of this waging war has left them exhausted. They're just tired. Uh, they want to continue with creation, but they themselves don't want to do it. So they create mankind to carry on their work of creation really as their slaves. Mankind is going to do the work. The gods are going to now have a Sabbath. They're going to have rest because they need rest, unlike Yahweh. They need rest. They're desperately in need of it. And that the humans exist now so that they can prosper. They can prosper while they have someone to carry on their backbreaking work. And what's interesting is all of this kind of shapes how the Egyptians live. They have their Pharaoh, their God King, uh, some believe is Ra incarnate. And he enslaves the Israelites, forces them to work so that they can have rest, so that they can have economic prosperity at the expense of Israel. And so God brings them out of this, 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 this disrupted, this false view of Sabbath and says, where once you existed to provide Sabbath for a God king, a false God king, now you exist, yes, to work, but also, also to rest with God. He invites them into what he is doing, this delighting. He is realigning their way of life. He's pointing them away from a culture that is about, uh, uh, that, that honors pagan gods amongst other things. And he says, now you're going to be a part of a culture that is focused on the ways of the one true God. It is an act of cultural rebellion. And this idea of working for someone else has always been carried throughout history. It's a sentiment I see quite frequently today, this feeling that we are always working uh, tirelessly to achieve while somebody else is, 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 is really benefiting more so than us for our work. How many people today feel like they have to work continually and if they stop working, everything will fall apart, that their entire lives is about working and achieving and doing. And what God is saying to them in Sabbath and what we can find in Sabbath is that we're not defined. We don't have value based on what we do. Instead, we are defined by whose we are. It's a realigning of our life and our, our values uh, away from a culture and towards God. So we've had this definition of worship, a treasuring of God above all things that overflows into external acts of glorification. When we Sabbath, we are treasuring God in God's ways and we are doing these external acts of glorification. We're delighting, we are, we are rebelling against a culture, against the ways of the world, but we're also really uh, rebelling not just against the culture, but kind of what culture ingrains in us. The, what we would sometimes call like the, the desires of the flesh, our own ways that we, that we look to instead of God's ways. And I want to say that, that this cultural rebellion also takes on this form of sacrifice. Sacrifice is part of what we are doing as we are rebelling against the evil ways of the world. Uh, and so every time that we, that we Sabbath, right, we are sacrificing something. That's true really of anything you do. You are always, when you are doing something, saying no to other things. And when we are Sabbathing, in my case with my family, a 24-hour period on a Saturday, we are saying no to a multitude of other things that we could be doing. We are making a sacrifice as we trust God, as we look to his ways instead of maybe the desires that we have. So every time that I Sabbath, I am sacrificing. I'm sacrificing uh, one. I am sacrificing um, the really the mastery of my time, uh, the mastery of my schedule. Every time I'm sacrificing, I'm saying, God, I believe this was what you desire for me and my family, even if it was contrary to what I may be desiring to do on that particular day. 
Every time I Sabbath or sometimes when I Sabbath, I am sacrificing my wealth because the reality is at every day that exists, I have the opportunity to work. I could go get a second job on a Saturday and, and, and everybody always feels like they could have more money. I could be going doing odd jobs around people's houses to bring in more money for my family so that uh, my pocketbook would increase. And instead I am sacrificing my wealth so that I can Sabbath, that I can turn towards God instead of my uh, monetary desires. Every time I Sabbath, right? I'm putting aside my ego because part of what happens on those days, uh, the days off, right? We have projects at home. We have property that we want to improve. We have seemingly an infinite number of things we could be doing to make our household and the surrounding area better, right? Right now at our home, we have, we have our front tore up. We've been doing some massive excavation work. It's going to be fantastic when it's all done. But right now, uh, it's sitting as like this big mud pit. And every day that I Sabbath, I'm not working on that project. And what's happening is there's this part of me, there's this part of me that I want to appear to everyone else like I've got it all together, like I'm productive, like I'm not lazy. And so people are coming over to our house constantly and they're seeing, instead of a finished product, they're seeing uh, loose gravel or dirt and rock and part of me, I have to put aside my desire to appear a certain way to others and instead choose to Sabbath, to trust in God, to follow his ways and his rhythm of life. Sabbath is not a requirement, but it is a practice that is an act of worship. And in this practice, we are both delighting and rebelling against a culture. Uh, thank you guys for, for, for joining us today. I love you, and I'm going to release the campus pastors. Thanks for sticking around today, our transformational moment. Just have a couple questions really to ask in relation to Sabbath. The first is, what is your largest barrier to practice Sabbath? Uh, for most of us, this, this question really has to do with probably busyness. We are an incredibly busy people. We always are, our, our schedules are full. And the idea of taking a Sabbath, uh, for a lot of people, they look around and go, where is that going to fit? Where, how can I fit a Sabbath into uh, a schedule that has no room? And so everything, every time we choose to do something, we're choosing not to do something. So what in your life is the largest barrier to Sabbath? And then the second question, how can you carve out time this week for Sabbath rest and worship? Uh, it, it is hard to institute a Sabbath, particularly in a culture that has no value for Sabbath. Right? Everything around us does not value the Sabbath rest. Uh, and so trying to institute what was a 24-hour period of rest can seem impossible. Uh, but it's not a requirement but it is beneficial. So how can you somehow insert Sabbath rest? Maybe for you, that just means finding a two, four, six hour period of your week where you can practice this, this rest, this delighting, this, this, uh, the rejection of a culture and just delight in God and enjoy this time of rest. Thank you guys and have a great day.